Hey guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. It's a girl Fanny Longu back with another reaction video. If you are new to this channel, make sure to give this the thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. Like I said, my name is Fanny Longu. So if there's anything that you guys want us to react to, let us know by dropping the link in the comment section below. We'll be more than glad to react to it a big shout out to everyone that has subscribed to us thank you for subscribing liking commenting sharing and everything that you guys do and thank you for just requesting us to um react to stuff thank you for 18,000 subscribers we really appreciate i hope you guys are doing all right i may stay blessed a big shout out to the person that suggested this they suggested i react to why is there no historical criticism of the quran as there is of the bible very interesting and i'm eager to learn or hear what this video has to say so without wasting time let's get into the video hello again and in this episode uh, i just want to um explore a bit further um the bible and the quran um in terms of where they came from and a questions of scholarship critical scholarship particularly when it's applied to the bible and the quran and the first um text i want to share with you is back to this one uh quran uh, and the secular mind a philosophy of islam by shabir akhtar who as i said before was a, was a lecturer in uh, theology at oxford and um the second book is uh this one called Reflections by Guy Eaton. This is the last book he wrote before he sadly passed away. And um, both um, passages I'm going to read complement each other. They are more or less saying the similar kind of thing, but with a different uh, emphasis. Right? They're both of value. So um, uh, Shabbat Akhtar starts uh, off um, looking at um, the origins of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible and then compares that with the Quran. And in a similar way, Guy Eaton makes uh, an observation as well. So Shabbat Akhtar says, unlike the scriptures of other extant historical religions, the Quran is contemporaneous with the faith it established. The Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament, for instance, came to acquire belatedly the status of scripture within their communities. Groups of churchmen, in the case of the Greek New Testament, canonized a set of writings well over three centuries after the events uh, those books and letters allegedly, allegedly record. Actually, for some books, it was much later, but I'm not going to go there. The result is often seen, even by Christians and Jews, as a poorly edited anthology of religious literature. The Quran status is different. It is self-described as revelation, unlike the Bible, and it single-handedly created the community that treated it authoritatively, not the converse. No discipline among the sciences of the Quran corresponds to the critical historical concerns of critical biblical scholarship, a field covering textual criticism as well as form, source, redaction, literary and historical criticism. The Muslim reluctance to develop the discipline of critical Quranic scholarship is mistakenly thought to be connected to religious obscurantism. In fact, there are no materials and no need for such a discipline. The Quran, unlike the Bible, is not the heterogeneous work of many hands in several genres, in a trio of languages, in varied geographical locales, stretching over millennia, surviving only in uncertain and fragmentary forms. It is a unified canon, revealed in just over two decades, addressed to a man fully known to his contemporaries and to subsequent history, a man living in only two geographical locations in the same country. It was written in one language, in the language of the recipient, Arabic obviously, and of the first audience, a living language that is still widely spoken. The period between its oral revelation and final authoritative compilation is only about two decades. Apart from some variant readings that, that do not materially affect the sense, the text is invariant, defined and fixed. Textual emendation editing the text to remove alleged corruptions and errors in copying, was never permitted. The text has retained a perfect purity, a unique version, 
has always enjoyed universal currency during the entire history of Islam. I cannot see, barring motives of malice and envy that should have no place in scholarship, any grounds for developing a critical textual scholarship of the Quran. So that sets up the contrast nicely, I think, from the Muslim point of view between the genesis of the Bible and, and of the Quran and why we can't have uh, the same kinds of textual, critical, historical analysis of the Quran if the Quran's claims are true. Guy Eaton says something uh, similar, and there's another comment he makes, which I'll just throw in for good measure, which I think is just rather good. And he says, uh, this leads to two questions which I and other Muslims in the West are frequently asked. Why, in the first place, is there no historical criticism of the Quran as there is of the Bible? Here we have a simple misunderstanding. The Bible is made up of many different parts compiled over many centuries. It is possible to cast out on one part without impugning the rest. But the Quran is a single revelation received by just one man. Either you accept it for what it claims to be, in which case you are a Muslim, or you reject this claim and so place yourself outside the fold of Islam. So basically he's saying the similar things to uh, Shabit Akhtar. And then he goes on, and this is a different subject, but fascinating. Secondly, we are sometimes asked why we hesitate to adapt the Quran to the needs of our modern age. The book answers itself, itself answers this question. There is no changing the words of God. The fact that it was sent down in the 7th century of the Christian era and not the 21st is irrelevant. You do not wear down a diamond by constant handling, and the passage of the centuries cannot erode the words of God. That, after all, is the whole point of a divine intervention in the affairs of this world. The act, the revelation, is located in time, but it is itself timeless. And Islamic theology always defines the essence of the Quran as uncreated, therefore eternal. This question is so important in relation to contemporary religious debate that I hope to return to it later in the talk. For the moment, suffice it to say that Muslims, that as Muslims, we ask not how the book can be adapted to our lives in the world of today, but how our daily lives can be adapted to the Quran. That is the real problem, says Guy. Mm -hmm. And this really gets to the heart of many of these debates over specific issues, whether it be sexual morality or how we deal uh, with other religions and so on. The, the, church, the churches typically adapt their scriptures to uh, the needs of today. So they will delete, ignore, overlook um, or reinterpret passages so that it fits in comfortably with the Weltanschauung, the worldview and the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, uh, usually the Western zeitgeist. Um, whereas the Quran uh, asks, in fact, uh, states as it's the, the eternal word of God, the speech of God himself, uh, it, 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 does, it cannot be changed like that. Uh, there's either submission to the truth of God or one is in rebellion to it. But anyway, I just wanted to share those two passages with you. I think they're they're fascinating. Uh, whether you believe them or not, they they express a, a key insight into the Muslim worldview uh, and, and how their religion works, if you like. Um, and I think it's worth sharing for that reason. Thank you. Very interesting um, video. I really enjoyed this and I wish I had carried on um, just for a little more minutes. Otherwise, um, I mean, when you speak to a Muslim or watch Muslim movies, not movies, um, videos, they're going to say the Quran is the word of God. But for the Bible, it's different. There's different people that have written it, claiming it is the word of God and all those things. The Bible has certain parts that they say have been preserved and certain parts that we all know, not all, no, not all of us know, that have been actually removed out of the Bible. And you're thinking, if it's the word of God, why would you want to remove them? What's that to hide? Why don't you want people to, to read or to know? And other than that, I don't know, was it in English? Has the language changed? But otherwise, it's 
even in different versions creating even extra confusion and as compared to the quran which is still in arabic has been preserved never once has someone said it was edited this and that different no it's very very different ask yourself but why why is it like this so at the end of the day it's really up to you to decide on what you're going to go for am i going to believe this or am i going to believe the latter so and make your decisions according to what speaks truly to your heart what you know is the truth don't let anyone convince you otherwise otherwise love this video let me know what you guys actually think make sure to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe and i'll see you in my next reaction video